Here are just a few amazing stories about non-human animals. Crows have been known to pick up nuts that they can't break themselves with their beaks, and they'll fly them out over a road or a highway, and they'll drop, it, they'll drop the nut into oncoming traffic, and the cars will then um, go over the nut, crack it open, and then they go and collect what's inside so they can eat. In Tokyo, this is so well known uh, that drivers often purposely look for the crows uh, and try to aim for, for the nuts to help them out. This is a kill deer, so another type of bird. And they're known for faking an injury. So the bird will go down onto the ground and act like there's something wrong with her wing. Her wing is somehow broken. Ethologists wonder, well, why do they do this? Well, they've realized that there's a, probably a predator nearby and the predator is looking for the eggs or the young of the bird. And so the bird will distract the predator by acting like they're injured so that at the last second, instead of getting nabbed by whatever predator, um, they'll miraculously recover and then take off, having then protected their young. The, these are orcas, uh, and this is an, an image of a, of a pretty well-known story that happened just a few years ago of a mother um, who was mourning her uh, dead calf, and she carried this calf around in the water for a long, long time before she was able to let the calf go. Um, and so this is an instance of non-human mourning, of, of, of animals non-human uh, mourning their dead. And incidentally, the crow you just saw, crows are also known to do this. They'll mourn their dead. They'll even go off and pick up twigs together and come back and lay the twigs on the, on the, on the body of the crow that, that's passed away, um, almost like, or maybe just like, a type of ceremony, a type of um, a funeral rite for their, their fellow bird. Orcas are also matriarchal, uh, so they're matriarchal societies. And ethologists have, have been wondering about this, that once um, orcas hit menopause and then they can no longer give, give birth, they wondered, well, why are they kept around? And they're kept around for a long, long time. Um, and the reason is, is because they, these are the ones who do the teaching. Um, knowledge is passed down from uh, the elders, from, from the elder females in the, in the orca pods. So this is an instance of acculturation, of, of learning through generations. Dolphins are also amazing um, 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 mammals underwater. There are all sorts of incredible stories about dolphin intelligence, sociability, um, um, uh, and I can only, I'm, I'm just going to give you one. So you may or may not know that the way they see the world is through echolocation. So they literally can see through things, especially the, the human bodies. It's a type of uh, sonar underwater. And there's this incredible story of a researcher of a dolphin coming up to her and constantly like poking her on the, on the stomach um, and, and showing her her own stomach. The dolphin is showing uh, is her own stomach. And the researcher then goes, gets tested, and lo and behold, uh, she finds out that she's pregnant with a child. And she realized that the dolphin could see, and could, could, could see that she'd been pregnant even before she knew it. Um, and it's quite incredible to think that this dolphin, who knew this before this woman, uh, was, was in some ways bonding and showing, hey, I'm also pregnant, and was also showing the, the, the baby dolphin that was developing in, in her own body. Um, so as far as a, as a moment of communication um, and, and, and relating between a human and non-human, it's an incredible story and one of many that has to do with dolphins. Octopus are also incredible uh, uh, creatures. If you've never seen um, the My Octopus Teacher, that film that came out, it was a big sensation about a year ago. It's highly recommended. Uh, do watch it at some point. Octopus are known for all sorts of amazing feats, um, one of which is using tools. They're able to use objects around them as tools. This will be both in a lab, they can get into a lot of mischief, but also in the so-called wild, um, where they use shells and they use all sorts of things in their daily lives. Um, and one thing they're known to do is to de decorate uh, their dens. They'll use colorful objects, sometimes it'll be, you know, uh, pollution and plastic. Sometimes it'll be really nice 
uh, seashells and that sort of thing, and they're known to actually decorate their, uh, where they live. So this is incredible because this means that octopus have an aesthetic sensibility, that they, they find things um, visually pleasing um, in a way that maybe, especially in art history, we've thought only humans had. Um, and octopus are likely not alone in having a sense of simply enjoying what they see um, and possibly even having a sense of what's beautiful. The lowly mice, who are probably the most experimented on animals uh, in history, uh, they're also incredible. Um, they can attest to all sorts of, of proclivities and, and behaviors and ways of being, one of which is altruism, so doing something for others. Mice in experiments are known for liberating other mice in, when they're trapped in clear plastic tubes um, as a sign of helping someone out. Rats, who we'll probably see on the subway or in the city, they're fellow denizens of ours in New York City. Uh, rats are known to liberate other rats from, from entrapment in a laboratory, in an experiment, even if chocolate is an alternative, and they love chocolate. So this means that their sense of altruism, of, of wanting to help a fellow rat, is stronger than their uh, desire for eating chocolate and for, for pleasure. So quite incredible experiments. Chickens, um, who are the most exploited animal on the planet by sheer number, um, uh, they're also incredible. Um, with chickens, we, no we notice uh, empathy. They've been understudied as far as birds are concerned, but recently um, animal behavior scientists have been studying chickens. And one, in one in really interesting experiment is uh, this experiment, well, they'll take a chick, um, an offspring, of, of, a, of an adult uh, chicken, um, and they'll blow air at the, at, the, at, the, at the chick. They're not really hurting the chick, but, but the air does make them kind of wince, and it looks uncomfortable, and they realize that the mother chicken also winces and also feels discomfort. Um, and so this is a way of, of validating, of verifying a form of empathy, to be able to feel for another um, which is quite incredible, though really it makes sense um, um, from a Darwinian standpoint that mammals and birds and highly social creatures that live alongside us would have a sense of kinship when it came to um, those they lived with, especially those that, that are their that, that are offspring, um, that are their parent-child relationship. Friends of the Wall is a, a well-known uh, primatologist who, in this image here, is working with capuchin monkeys. Um, and this attests to a sense of fairness uh, and even justice. So it's a pretty incredible experiment. We have two capuchin monkeys, uh, one, on the right, one on the left, one on the right, you're seeing here. And the experimenter has two different treats that, that she gives them. Um, and one is clearly a nicer treat than the other. And so at first, they both get the nice treats. But then after a while, um, the researcher starts to favor one uh, capuchin monkey over the other. So she gives her um, uh, the nice treat, and then the other monkey gets the inferior treat. And after a few rounds of this, the, the one who's getting the inferior treat starts getting mad and doesn't even eat them, and at one point even just throws them through the holes that are in the, the barrier um, in protest. So if that's not incredible enough, what happens next is even more incredible. The monkey that's get, having a real great time and getting all the good treats realizes that her friend is not getting the nice treats um, and is also not happy with this. And so she starts to reject, reject the nice treats until she sees that her friend, her, her companion, her fellow capuchin monkey also gets the nice treats again, which the researcher then does. And so this is incredible because this tells us that, this, that, that these capuchin monkeys have a, set, a sense of what's, uh, what's fair or what's just. Um, it felt unjust for, for um, one, one monkey to get this nice treat and the other one to not get it. If they both could easily just get the nice treat, life would be much better. Um, and so this is an incredible experiment that attests to uh, of uh, the idea and the concept of fairness and justice 
in the non-human uh, in the non-human world. Chimpanzees, um, along with bonobos, are the closest to us from an evolutionary standpoint. Ninety-seven percent of our DNA are the same. Um, all sorts of there are all sorts of ways in which chimp chimpanzees have been shown to be intelligent. In some ways, more intelligent, more intelligent or capable than humans. Um, here is a, a well-known experiment of a memory game with numbers. You can also uh, search for this on the web. There'll be a, a video of it. Uh, basically, you see the numbers super fast, and then they go away, and then you have to count them down, one, two, three, four, five, in the right order. Um, and chimpanzees are able to do this much more proficiently than, um, than, than humans who try to play this game. Um, so this attests, attests to analytical skills, arithmetic, uh, memory, uh, quickness, sharpness. It's quite something. And then, of course, this doesn't even mention all the ways in which bonobos um, and chimpanzees are able to understand language and use language, sign language, but also through the help of lexigrams, which are a computer that will vocalize certain words through symbols they're able to actually have conversations with uh, human researchers. And then finally, uh, pigs, um, who are able, are also very intelligent social creatures. Um, they've been known in experiments to, to, to have a great time and to do really well when, uh, when they're put to video games. So this is like a Pong uh, video game that this pig is playing with. Um, and this gets to one of the most important ideas in the animal behavior sciences and ethology, uh, cognitive ethology, so the study of animal behavior, which is the idea of play. We're not the only ones who have a sense of play, who are playful. Um, play is an activity that's seen throughout the animal kingdom for various reasons, um, some of which have to do with uh, learning, um, and some of which has to do with simply um, enjoying. Um, so uh, this pig is uh, learning, but also enjoying this, this activity and enjoying life. And so these are just a few of the experiments and observations that we've come to find and learn so much more about the fellow earthlings that we share this planet with uh, in the past few decades. There's really been a revolution in our understanding of those other creatures, those other beings that we call animals. And everything I've described, and many more stories and experiments could be offered, everything I've just described attests to the fact that non-human animals, to varying degrees, have language, have sociability, have culture, in the sense culture in its most basic definition is um, to have a trait that doesn't come through genetic uh, material, but is done through, um, through living and through uh, learning from others. Using tools, having empathy, and even having distinct personalities. So for the longest time, the idea of species sort of made, let's say, crows and pigs and chickens and cows and uh, gorillas and giraffes and all, every, 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 um, uh, every animal that you might uh, think of to a certain degree of complexity, it was as if they were just all the same, programmed to be that type of species. But even more recently, you have animal behavior scientists who now start to study variation within species and vari variations in personalities. Um, so that there's, there are forms of individuation in non-human communities and non-human uh, non animals. And for anyone that, that has ever lived with a dog or a cat or a parrot or a rabbit or really any, um, um, any animal, they'll know that they can pick them out of a crowd if they had to. They'll know that there's something singular about that, um, about, about that, that, that companion that they've, they've come to know and live with. Um, and so it's probably not surprising for us to start thinking that uh, animals in the wild, but also animals that are, uh, that, that are used in animal agriculture, 
um, that they too aren't just a sea of identical uh, uh, commodities, but that they also have distinct traits and personalities and variation within, uh, within their modes of, of living. And so all of this, the idea that non-human animals have community, language, sociability, culture, empathy, uh, theories of justice, individual personalities, all this goes an incredibly long way in the endeavor to think non-anthropocentrically. So to be anthropocentric is to think that humans are the be-all, end-all of existence, um, the apex of existence, um, and that the way in which society, culture, politics, and, and environmentalism, the way these things should, should be thought of and run, should be to cater to the anthro, to, 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 to the human. Now, especially in this class, but it's not just in class, a number of thinkers, a number of, of uh, environmentalists, and all sorts of other people are starting to think non-anthropocentrically and starting to think about the ways in which animals, uh, but not only animals, um, the, the plant world, the, fu the, the fungi world, um, and ecology at large, the way in which these things have a big say in our societies, in our politics, and of course, in um, the environmental realities of, of this, this planet. And so in one of our first sessions, when we were talking about getting away from the human-animal divide, to think that humans are on one side and they have all these things that are really uh, unique, um, and then all the other animals, which if you stop and think about it, it's kind of crazy to lump all these creatures together under one category. But in any case, um, then all the animals don't have those things, okay? Um, so the human-animal divide is really porous um, and in many, many ways is non-existent. And for anyone who's read Darwin already, um, already in the 19th century, Darwin understood this. Darwin, one of his most well-known uh, phrases and ways of thinking is to say that there is no difference between um, human, uh, human and non-human animals that, that, that is total. He says all differences are one of degree and not of kind. So differences are one of degree. So we use language, we have empathy, um, we have culture, we use tools, so we have personality, so on and so forth. All these other animals also have those things, but to different degrees and to different flavors uh, and in different modes of, of living. And so this is incredible because it really opens up a whole other way of seeing the world. Uh, one in which we're not cut off from the world, but one in which the world is now this much more rich, communicating, um, socially complex uh, realm um, in which we can find wonder, uh, but also as part of this class, in which we can find solutions to um, some of our many environmental and political crises. And so I'd like to show you a work an incredible video work by Lauren Calzadilla that attests to and that works with these ideas that I've just given you in a way that involves an artwork but also sort of you know creative modes of thinking um, so in some ways doing science through art um, and art can always be in, in many ways sort of more exploratory and, and more daring um, and think in ways that that might be different from the way scientists think. Um, so let me show you this short clip. This is a work called The Great Silence from 2014. You can watch the whole thing on Vimeo, uh, and I highly recommend it. It's just a really wonderful work. But this is just one clip, um, and the only way I'm going to set it up for you, the only thing you need to know, is that it's in Puerto Rico, um, and it splices two different scenes. One is um, um, the Arecibo, which is a now defunct um, 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 uh, research station in uh, Puerto Rico that was part of the SETI project, which, which uh, looked for signs of extraterrestrial life. Uh, it was, it was uh, built in the 1960s, in the late 1960s. And so you have scenes of this large dish that is, uh, when this was made, it was still operational. Uh, you have this large dish uh, and these sort of graphic readouts that are looking for and trying to see if they're getting any signals from extraterrestrial life. 
just next to this the Arecibo, just next to this research center for alien alien life, is a reserve for Puerto Rican uh, parrots, um, who used to be abundant in the forest around there, uh, but for various reasons, including the environmental uh, crises that we talk about in this class, they're now endangered. And so you'll also see images of these beautiful Puerto Rican parrots in this reserve that's just next to it. Um, so that's really all you need to know as far as going into, into, this, into this work. So I'm going to show you a clip from it now.
it's such a lovely and thought-provoking work um, and gives us a lot of things to think about and relate to um, not only everything that I've discussed and presented so far in this lecture, but also what we turn to next, um, which is more directly tied to the environmental impact of the way we, um, we've, treated, we've treated animals, uh, especially in the food industries. Um, so think about this work, uh, maybe write about it, um, but let's definitely um, bring it into our discussion uh, when, when we meet. For now, let's shift towards um, more direct and larger scale uh, questions and problems that have to do with non-human animals and the, the environment. Um, so just a few statistics, a good, things, a good thing for us, good things for us to think about and know. So every year, 1.5 billion cows, um, hundreds of millions of sheep, goats, and pigs, and about 50 to 60 billion individuals of other species, mainly chickens, um, are, are killed um, in, in, um, in animal agriculture. And this doesn't even include what m most scientists think um, are likely the trillion um, earthlings that live in the ocean, um, so fish and so on and so forth. Um, this is, these are staggering, staggering numbers. Um, numbers aren't everything, but still, uh, these are these are really staggering numbers. Um, there is um, estimates that the 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 biomass of of mammals on Earth, um, humans are are four percent or something like that, and cattle are something like sixty percent. I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's quite in, in quite incredible. Um, so that's that's those are numbers to keep in mind. Waste and pollution um, that affect both human and non-human communities. So waste and pollution is a major major problem when it comes to animal agriculture. You may or may not know that the Gulf of Mexico, right, right, uh, coming out of the Mississippi River, because uh, uh, the Middle America has so many of these large-scale uh, feedlots and uh, factory farms. Uh, for which there is no way to contain all the pollution, uh, blood, fertilizer, uh, manure, waste, everything. Uh, it's, there's just so much of it. We're talking about billions of animals, right? There's so much of it, there's really no way to contain it. So it gets into the, into the ground, into the water table, goes down into the river. Um, and today it's created the biggest dead zone in the world in the Gulf of Mexico because it all falls out there. Um, and a dead zone is a place in, in, in the ocean or in a body of water where in nothing can live. Um, so just the waste and the pollution alone from animal, animal agriculture is catastrophic. And of course, not only for wild ecosystems, but also for human communities that live near these places, um, uh, which I think you can probably guess, um, usually um, is, is, is uh, there's a class dimension to this, right? These places are in uh, poorer communities um, and those humans that are less represented, represented in, in uh, society and in politics. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a major issue. We should also talk about resources. 70% <clears throat> of fresh water is used to farm animals better than um, slaughtered and then um, sent down distribution chains that for the most part go to you know so-called developed countries or at least to those those humans on the planet that can afford to um, um, uh, to, to buy meat uh, this is incredible especially as the the, um, the planet warms um, and water becomes more and more scarce um, this means that that uh, we're privileging certain bodies mainly cattle, um, that then are extracted, their bodies are extracted um, in industry. We're priori prioritizing, industry is prioritizing those bodies rather than the more the precarious human beings who live on this planet along with us who don't have fresh water or clean water um, and, and, and things are only going to get worse as the as the certification and um, um, water becomes more scarce as the, as the planet keeps warming. There's also the issue of land use. 75% of land use, is, land use is reserved for animal agriculture and a staggeringly 60% of crops grown are for animal agricultural feed. 
So now we think about the allotment of resources where uh, there are, there, there's land that could be used to grow food for people that really need it, um, people who, who undergo famine, and there are a lot of people um, in the world who are at risk of famine and malnutrition or are already uh, malnourished and in famine conditions. Um, and so again, this is, uh, in my estimation, a perverse use of, of resources to use land uh, and 75% of land and 60% of crops for bodies that live short lives and, and their, their flesh is extracted um, along the distribution change of, of, of uh, animal agriculture um, when those lands could either be rewilded um, or used and used for uh, uh, growing food for, for human beings. Um, human beings that, that need it. So we're seeing that the, the numbers and the scale, the 105 billion cows and the, the, the many hundred billions <clears throat> of these other animals, the resources that are used uh, create a really unjust and unequal um, um, landscape of food and industry. Um, and so thinking about food justice, we have to think about um, the role of non-human animals um, and the industries that exploit them have had on the environment um, and, and on society. Animal agriculture, and this is where we get to the, the in some ways, the, 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 the largest issue, um, if, if, if I can even say that, um, is responsible for approximately 14.5% of anthropogenic greenhouse gases, much of it uh, in the form of methane, uh, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. So this means that Animal agriculture, 14.5% is actually, may very well be, well be a low estimate, but even so, it is, it's then responsible for the second um, most emissions um, behind fossil fuels, which we talked about last week. So along with everything else we've discussed, this is another uh, major, major issue um, of the emissions that come from large-scale industrial animal agriculture which <clears throat> exacerbates global warming. Not only because of the emissions, these 14.5% of emissions, but also animal agriculture is the leading driver of deforestation, especially in the Brazilian Amazon, which we're going to talk about in a moment. So this means that not only is it emitting, not only are these large animal industries emitting the second highest amount of, of greenhouse gases, but also these gases that would otherwise uh, help and, and be sequestered by, by plant life, by forests, um, those forests are being cleared, um, either for grazing or for growing feed and crops, which means there's less greenhouse gases like CO2 and methane uh, being sequestered, which means even more global warming. On top of that, the deforestation, um, and again, especially in the Amazon, there's a staggering number of species that go extinct every day because of this industry. Um, and you may or may not know, we'll, we'll talk about this uh, in another session, I think, uh, a little more fully, but we're into the sixth mass extinction. Elizabeth Colbert has written about this, a, a whole book about the sixth mass extinction. Um, this is a, a debated number in some ways by scientists, but there have been five mass extinctions in this planet's history. The most famous being uh, the one that uh, the, 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 in the Yucatan, um, the asteroid that, that killed all the, the dinosaurs uh, millions of years ago. Um, but since this is the Anthropocene, this is the first mass extinction event that's caused by human activity. So all the five before were, were mass extinction events that, of course, were not driven by human activity. The humans weren't even around yet. Uh, but the one we're undergoing today, which, which again is leading to a staggering number of, of species that are going extinct, um, is on the watch of, of, of humanity and especially um, human industry and animal agriculture. So these are all things to really think about and keep in the back of, my, of, of our minds when we're talking about um, non-human animals and environmental crises in this, in this class. There's an artist, uh, Mishka Henner, um, who one day was uh, going around Texas trying to find oil fields uh, to photograph. Um, 
thinking, you know, this would be a, uh, some incredible work and also a type of activist work to see all this oil um, uh, damaging, uh, damaging the, the landscape. Instead, what Mishka Henner started seeing are these massive feedlots of cattle in Texas uh, and started to photograph them. But it's illegal to go and actually photograph uh, um, on the lots themselves. And so Mishka Henner used uh, a drone. So these are images that are really, really high up. Um, and so the lagoon there you're seeing on the right, that's all manure and fertilizer and pollution, as we just talked about. And then all those little specks that you're seeing on the left in those different lots, there looks like there are about 30 of them, but there are many more on the landscape. All those little dots are, uh, are cows, are individual cows. And here's uh, another one. It's a whole series. Um, if you want to check out all of them, go to Mishka Henner's uh, website. They're all, they're all there. Um, so again, the, the feedlots, um, the individual animals um, in, in the feedlots, and then these pools of, of, of blood and pollution that line the landscape. Uh, which again have an impact not only on um, that that local the local ecosystems, but also the communities that live there, and then ultimately um, um, the the dead zone in the in the, the 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 Gulf of the Gulf of Mexico. I don't know if these specifically get there, uh, but they're they're an example of the staggering level of of pollution. Um, which, again, you need drone photography to even encompass part of it. Um, so the, the, the scale is, is rather s staggering. And I remember a few years ago, um, these images continue to, to haunt me um, in North Carolina. North Carolina is one of the biggest producers of, of pork, so this means um, uh, pigs. Um, and there was Hurricane Florence, which caused all this, all this uh, flooding um, and all these, these animals uh, to, to perish, to flood, and to, to drown. Um, and so there was, there was a way in which um, these sites, these factory farms that are normally hidden from view, um, the animals are, are normally hidden from view, um, they come bubbling out almost like these, these pink balloons, um, um, and they, they, they became, uh, this became uh, national news, at least for, for, for a brief moment. Um, and we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the rising water, the, the intensity of Hurricane Florence and other weather events are exacerbated by global warming. And what else exacerbates global warming uh, and greenhouse emissions? Well, animal industries like this. So we're seeing a vicious circle here and we're thinking ecologically um, the way in which I would, I, would, um, I would include these industries for sure within our conception of disaster capitalism, um, the way in which disaster capitalism uh, is this destructive feedback loop uh, where, in this case, more animals are farmed, um, more emissions and pollution, the, the more the earth uh, warms, the more severe uh, weather events and rising water, which then leads to... Um, to what you're seeing, what you're seeing here, and this is just one example of many uh, of, of many. Another issue that we should mention is the role that zoonotic disease plays in all this. Uh, zoonotic means of animal uh, of animal origins, um, and we know to a pretty good degree of of likelihood that our current pandemic, uh, the coronavirus COVID nineteen, came from the body of a bat. In, um, in an animal market. Um, uh, though this is less so now, but certainly at the time when this was getting more coverage, uh, there, there were subtly racist, sometimes not so subtly racist, ways of spinning this that somehow uh, so-called non-Western wet markets or animal, uh, animal markets, live markets, that somehow those are the those are the the the, the culprit and they're dangerous and, and dirty and so on and so forth, but for every uh, pandemic or epidemic historically that's come from a non-Western the so-called non-Western uh, market, there have been others that have come from standard European American uh, so-called Western forms of animal animal production. Uh, so the, the the one of the deadliest. Um, 
pandemics in history would be the Spanish flu of 1918, which came from uh, either pigs or chickens. Um, there have been bird flu epidemics. There have been swine flu epidemics. Um, and in, in, our, in our lifetimes, or in my lifetime anyways, uh, the, the, the swine flu panic from 2009 in Argentina, um, that was, I remember that being in the news, and I remember that had the possibility of becoming a much bigger issue than it turned out to be. Uh, and of course, swine flu comes from, from pig farming. Um, so uh, within this mix of environmental issues that we've been talking about, greenhouse gases, pollution, um, a dead zone, so on and so forth, the other thing that we have to mention and the other major risk and dangers that, that we should we should think about our zoonotic diseases. Um, and if you think about it, we all now know more or less how variants happen. Variants course through bodies, course through living bodies, and, and change and, and turn into different variants. Well, what better place than a factory farm for uh, variants? Because you have millions and millions of bodies that are cramped together, um, often sick, often immune compromised, um, and treated very uh, poorly. Uh, so what better place for vectors of, of disease than zoonotic illness, right? So that's something else we have to think about. And we'll, we're well on our way now to think, to be thinking along the lines of political ecology as we've, I think, securely established in this class, the ways in which the environment hooks up and connects to and impacts social, political, and economic uh, uh, realities. And so there's also there's all sorts of ways, but we, we really we've already discussed that non-human animals and especially their intensive um, extraction of their bodies and, and, and agriculture, we can tell already plays a big role um, in our politics um, and in the and, and in political ecology. And so I'd like to finish with uh, just a couple examples that even broaden this out further in within within a larger a larger history. Um, and it's going to start recently, but we're going to deep ba dip, uh, dip back into colonial history for, for, the, for these works. Uh, but let's start on August 19th, 2019, just a few years ago, at 4 p.m. So middle of the day, this is Sao Paulo in Brazil. And on that day, everyone noticed, living in Sao Paulo, but also all around the world, that this major city looked like it was actually uh, at night. It was completely... Um, dark. And why was it dark? It was dark because of the forest fires that were burning um, in the Amazon forest uh, nearby. Um, and one of the big reasons why we have, as I said before, one of the big reasons we have deforestation and forest fires and um, the loss of potential of carbon sequestration through forest fires um, and and, and uh, resulting pollution and emissions is because of uh, animal agriculture, either for pasturing or for growing soy that won't go to feeding humans, but will go towards feeding these millions, if not billions of cattle that are raised in the Amazon. Um, and Brazil is home to the largest meat companies in the world. And in fact, JBS is the largest meat company in the world. Um, so it's very central to the politics and to the ecology of, of this area. Um, and one of the, if this isn't enough already to, to talk about, uh, to understand this within the context of political ecology that affects humans, non-humans, and ecosystems all, all together, um, we should also mention that activist killings are very common. So environmental activists, these are three really well-known, Chico Mendes, Sister Dorothy Stang, and um, Jose Claudio Rivera da Silva. They were all assassinated. They were all murdered by either cattle ranchers or hired mercenaries or paramil paramilitary uh, mercenaries um, who were hired to, to murder them for their activist, activist activities. Uh, this is not... This is not limited to uh, animal agriculture, mining industries, um, the lumber industry, all these things are in some ways synergistic in the Amazon. Um, they too have killed 
uh, a number of, of act activists. Um, and so every year it's in the hundreds. Um, and these are just the activists. So this isn't even mentioning the indigenous communities and those that rely on the Amazon for, for, for their life, for their flourishing and for their communities. Um, and so within this mix, this political ecology of animal industry in the Amazon, we also have to add issues of land rights um, and indigenous rights, many of which are, are literally trampled on by, um, by these large meat companies in, in Brazil. And so let's take a look at one of the, probably one of the most well-known works by, um, by a, a contemporary Brazilian artist, um, and that's Silda Morales. And this is a work he did in 1987 called Mission Missions, How to Big Build Cathedrals. And it's an installation that you walk into, uh, this photograph, we're inside of it. So you're surrounded by this gauzy black fabric uh, that when you're outside of it, it's just kind of this glowing, uh, this glowing shape. So you walk into it and you notice a sidewalk, uh, a border of paving stones. And inside that paving stone, it's a, a sea of coins. It's a sea of money, right? From the middle of this sea of, of coins is a, a ladder of community uh, of communion wafers. And so this is referring to Catholicism and the Eucharist, um, an important sacrament for, for, for Catholics. Um, so these are wafers stacked up, um, and they it's like a ladder all the way up into the sky. Um, it ends at the, at the top. That's this backlit series of cow bones. These are actually tibias, the part of the, 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 the leg of, of a cow. And so there are hundreds of cowboys, uh, um, cow bones just dangling in the ceiling, backlit by a light that, that, beams, that beams down. So it's a very um, conceptual work. Um, at first, maybe it's not quite clear what it's trying to communicate. Um, I've never seen it in person, alas. Um, but I imagine seeing it in person is quite effective. Uh, it probably has this really sort of heavy, um, um, this heavy quality, like this real presence when, when, when you're there. Um, and there are all sorts of different ways of, of, of reading this work. In, um, one, it's kind of giving us the three major ways in which, now we're going way back in history, the three major ways in which European invaders were able to um, colonize the so-called New World, um, especially um, what we today call Latin America. So you may or may not know that in um, 1793, Christopher Columbus was the first to bring domesticated animals to uh, the so-called New World. So cattle, pigs, and chickens. I'm sorry, not chickens, uh, uh, sheep, um, and, and other animals. Uh, so he's the first to bring it over um, into the West Indies. Um, and the, these animals were crucial, uh, both politically and economically, for the, the, the Spanish and Portuguese colonizers. Um, and this is for at least two reasons. One, it provided an economy for colonization, for the, the, the practice of settler colonialism, uh, both in the Caribbean but also in uh, South America. But even more devastatingly, um, indigenous people that were living here, their immune systems were not prepared to be around these domesticated animals. Um, so diseases like smallpox, cowpox, decimated the, the uh, indigenous uh, peoples and indig indigenous communities that lived in, in Brazil, uh, it wasn't yet Brazil, but in, in South, um, South America, by the millions. Okay, so this was almost an instance, well, no, not almost. It was definitely an instance of biological warfare, but it was an unwitting biological warfare. The invaders, for, for the European invaders, this was, I, I suppose, a happy accident that the, the domesticated animals that they brought over proved to be deadly at the level of disease. Uh, so you see how far back zoonotic illness goes back in history um, as a catalyst for uh, for history and for power and for uh, and for war um, and in this case for for genocide so that's all represented by 
in many ways by these cow bones that are at, that are at the, the the top of this installation, um, and then the wafers will then uh, connote uh, and represent uh, Christianity, because of course um, these colonial invaders from Europe, uh, one of the things they were doing, they weren't just trying to get land and new resources, uh, but they were also trying to convert non Christians. Um, into the, the, the Christian church, most famously the Jesuits um, who, who came over um, in, South, in South America. So Morales is pointing out not only the role of, animal, of, of, of domesticated animals in this history, uh, but also the role of, of religious power, um, and then of course uh, money, right, uh, value. Uh, and some even argue, compellingly in my, to my mind, that the history of capitalism as we know it really begins here because uh, for capitalism to take off as it did in the 15th and, and 16th centuries, um, it needed more than just European land and resources to do so. Um, and so finding the so-called new world, quote unquote finding, um, proved to be a boon for the development of European capitalism uh, and ultimately capitalism in the, in, in the U.S. Uh, because it provided not only uh, uh, people to enslave, uh, but also new lands for uh, agriculture and for mining and for so-called natural resources, right? So at first, this seems like a very enigmatic work, but if we think about the, the components that he's included here, currency, money, uh, uh, wafers, religion, and, and cow bones, uh, agriculture, and, uh, and industry, animal industry. It makes, it makes a lot of sense. And if we tie it back to the contemporary, our contemporary moment, and the way in which the Brazilian Amazon is even, even further developed now with intensive agriculture, um, it's almost as if this work is working with two temporalities, so both colonial history, but also our current neo-colonial history, our, the contemporary moment, um, uh, which is dire for everyone involved, right? So it's a very rich work, uh, and he, he also has another work called Oblivion uh, that was made a, a, around the same time. I think we can consider it as a companion piece, because this too has uh, currency, Involved, so but but not as coins here as banknotes, and it's making up this indigenous structure, this TP. Uh, there's coal inside that TP. If you saw this in person, you would see that there's coal, so natural resource, but also the sounds of a chainsaw uh, emanating from the TP. So referencing, you know, taking over of land, uh, deforestation, logging, and so on and so forth. And then you have another sea of cattle bones. Of, of, uh, of cow bones and tibias that in this case represent, well, genocide. Um, um, they function metaphorically for um, activist killings, but also the history of, of, of colonial, um, colonial destruction and ecocide and genocide. Um, but then, of course, they're, they're also concrete. They're not just metaphoric or figurative. Like, these are literally the remains of bodies that, that were were uh, bred and then killed um, um, in, uh, in the Amazon um, and were used to, uh, 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 were used within the enterprise of not only colonial history but also current uh, multi multinational um, capitalist industries of, of, animal, of animal agriculture. And so these two works are, are really rich in that sense. They seem to, to work with two histories at once, and they try to they kind of show us the ways in which the political ecology inherent to these two histories uh, converge, right, in, in the present. And so now we turn to just one last example. Um, there are so many examples I could I could show you and talk about when it comes to animals and political ecology. Um, but let's conclude with, with this one um, <clears throat> by a photographer and artist named Nick Brandt who's worked a lot in uh, the African setting, um, especially as it pertains to wildlife um, and, uh, and animals that are, that are um, endemic to uh, areas in, in Africa. And so this work is, from, is in Kenya, and he worked with um, an, uh, a local community there, the Maasai community, 
um, an indigenous community. And he worked with them uh, on these photo shoots, which are pretty remarkable. And, and the, result, the resulting prints are pretty remarkable. So what he did is that he would set up these sets. These, uh, these are all sets. These are kind of like almost film sets that he con constructed um, um, near the Ambozeli National Park, which is a reserve for, for wildlife in Kenya. And the sets that he, that he constructed were, were these sets of the landscape that are marred by pollution, by extractivism, um, by, uh, by, by emissions, uh, and by um, um, ecological dep uh, de um, depredation. And so he had um, this local community, the Maasai community, come and pose and be actors within these, these photographs. And so what you're seeing um, are are these are these people that that live there, uh, the Maasai, that worked with him and and were again actors within 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 the shot, and so he would shoot them um, with with his um, camera, and then uh, he would leave the sets empty, um, and then wait for local uh, wildlife to come and start nosing around and looking at the sets. And interacting with the sets, and then once they did, he would he would take a photograph of the of the of, of the animals that would come, um, and then he would make a composite print. So he would take the first print that he had done with uh, with um, the the Maasai that lived there, and then um, make a composite print with with the animals that that came by. And so the print you're seeing, are, it's, it looks seamless. It looks like they're there together. But in fact, this elephant that tragically looks like he's drinking from this polluted uh, body of water um, is not actually there at the same time with, uh, with, with these people. Um, this is two different moments in one. But making this composite print almost, m almost creates this visual solidarity between uh, the wildlife and, uh, and, and the, the human population that, that lives there. And there are so many wonderful examples of um, of um, of this solidarity and community between uh, human and non-humans um, that that we could, that we could point to. And so, just one other example. There's a whole series of these. And if you go to Nick Brandt's website, uh, he has really beautiful high definition uh, reproductions of of these photographs on his website. So you can take a look and see some of these others. Uh, so this one is like a petrol station. Um, speaking of extraction from last week uh, in fossil fuels, um, so there's a set with this petrol station, and then at some point this uh, this uh, lion came by to check things out, and so the resulting composite print is the is the lion and and the petrol station and the people hanging around there. Um, so they're really effective prints, and um, I think there are all sorts of different ways that we can in interpret them and sort of dig deep and see where they take us. Uh, within this context of political ecology that collapses human and non-human, that collapses wild and non-wild nature and culture, um, and ultimately politics, society, the economy, and environment. Um, these prints, they invite us to see them all as one sutured, uh, enmeshed, connected thing uh, that we need, we, we need to understand and think through.